So here are the six stories that every leader should be able to tell. The first one is who I am story. The second one is why I am here story. My vision, my values, the teachings I can provide, and finally, what's going on in your mind story. As a leader, now let's understand why is it that you need to be able to tell these types of stories. Remember, stories are a powerful instrument to influence people. Stories connect the heart and the emotional sides of human beings. Stories help us deal with the paradoxes of life where both of those sides are true. So stories are very powerful techniques. So let's start with who I am. So like anytime you start leading a team, the first thing people want to know is this leader trustable? Can I trust this person? So when you are able to tell genuinely in an authentic way who you are as a leader and that you are not fake and that you are authentic, then that just builds trust. So if you are able to share who you are really with your team members, then you are going to build the foundation of trust. So that's the first type of story. Now that you have joined the team and they know a little bit about you as to who you are, then they also want to know as a team, why are you here as a leader? Like, okay, I understand who you are, but like, why are you here? And so the reason why you should be able to tell the story is to share with your team or the people that you're leading that, hey, you, are, you have a healthy ambition, but not an exploitative mind. So that's the distinction. Every team member that reports to you is trying to find out, is this leader having enough ambition and competitive spirit that they will continue to do well? But at the same time, will they exploit me? So that's where why I am here story is super important. It gives them a sense or a color as to how much ambition versus exploitative you are as a leader. And then the vision. Like, what is your vision as a leader for the group? There will be a lot of times where things can get tough. Situations unanticipated may come up. What is it that will get your team to persist, to have that grit, to continue, to deal with those negative situations, to deal with those setbacks? That's where your vision comes to life. Your vision about how what they're doing is important and why is it that it's important, the meaning behind it, will help them build courage, persistence, and grit towards overcoming issues that come across in any project. So it's super important to be able to tell your vision. Then the values, what kind of values you have. Every action can be codified as rules. You can say, hey, if this happens, do this. This happens, do that. But you cannot codify everything. That's where values come to life. It guides your actions. So if a leader can share why they value certain things, it, it could be coming, in, coming into office on time, or it could be starting the meeting on time. And there could be a deeper reason why the leader is doing what they're doing. If they share the story of what values they care about, that will be an action guide where people can take actions based on values. Example B, act like an owner, which is one such value we have at LinkedIn. Phenomenal. Now, you don't have to be told what you should do and not do, you act like an owner. So that's a great value. But if a leader can also tell you why that value is important, that gives you a deeper meaning and you'll remember that. What is perhaps, uh, maybe you can share one example, either from your family, your friends or teachers, because you refer to these three, uh, uh, these three stakeholders quite regularly. One example from your early life that you believe has influenced how you have led your life in a, in a professional setting, but you learned perhaps early on. Well, I think uh, it was my 
high school headmaster in Mysore city. He was extremely strict, very, very strict. Now he was teaching us chemistry and that was the last class of the day for 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. And I was sitting in the front bench. And that day, he was conducting an experiment where he needed to put common salt into a test tube. And he was being very, very careful about the amount of common salt that went into the test tube. I had a friend of mine called Anand Srinivas Prasad who was sitting next to me. And he burst out laughing. So Mr. K.V. Narayan stopped the experiment. He came uh, to our front bench and he said, hey man, what is so funny about what I was doing? See, children are generally more honest than elderly people. They have still not acquired the art of lying convincingly. And then Srinivas Prasad said, Sir, you are extremely stingy with common salt, which is so inexpensive. That's why I laughed. And then he said something which has lived with me even today. And that is, he said, Engman, this common salt belongs to this community called Shadavilas High School. It belongs to you, it belongs to me, it belongs to all the 50 students in this class, belongs to all the students in this high school, it belongs to every teacher, every staff. Therefore, I have to treat this common sort with utmost respect. And he said, on the other hand, five o'clock our class is finishing. Please come with me to my house. I will give you a glass full of common salt free because that's my personal property. You know, I, uh, Rowan, you remember uh, Sudha telling a, a story about my foolishness or idiosyncrasies at 40th year of <laughs> infancy. I think you were there, right? I think some of these things uh, stick in your mind. They don't go away. These, they form indelible mark on your psyche. The whole emphasis was run on that principle. That is, put the interest of the community ahead of your personal interest in everything you do in the short and medium term, and you will be a winner in the long term. So I think that is one thing that has stuck with me, and I think it will be there till I whatever, go with. Yeah. Teaching stories, every leader has a bunch of experience and wisdom that they come with. If they're able to tell you why that skill set that they are trying to share with you or getting you to train up on is important, now all of a sudden you understand the deeper reasons behind why the skill is important. Why should I learn this? Why should I do this work? So if they can explain why certain things that they're explaining, they're expecting you to do, and how that thing will be useful in the future, now all of a sudden they're able to share with you in a teaching manner certain wisdom that they have acquired, they can transfer it to you. And finally, knowing what you are thinking in your mind story. Imagine a new leader comes in and start off a meeting saying, hey, I know this meeting is going to be super boring, and that's what you had as an audience in mind. If a leader can read your mind on how you're thinking and doing and feeling, it acknowledges that the leader sees you. And automatically, you will drop your guard and be more receptive towards whatever they have to tell you. So people love it when you do your homework and say, what you know is guided by deep homework that you have done about people on how they are 
doing, how they're feeling, what they're going through, and bringing them along. They will feel seen and heard if they're able to tell this type of story. So remember, all of these types of stories, they connect not just your brain, which is the analytical side, but also your heart, the emotional side. Because without it, influence is hard. The head and the heart both have to be influenced to get action. So these are the six types of stories and why these are important. And I think that every powerful leader should do a lot of reflection and be able to tell each of these stories whenever they need. And it's a daily practice. They get better at it and they'll be able to tell better and better stories. The power of stories. Stories are very, very powerful, much more powerful than facts. Let's take a, take a look at five examples and I'll prove it to you why stories are more impactful than just facts and decisions. So the first one, the stories is less direct and more digestible. If you see two leaders in your team fighting among each other for some you know, resources, shared work, they're fighting. You can tell them as their leader, don't fight. But you could also tell them a story that says, hey, look, there were these two ducks. They found some food in a common area and they were just fighting for who gets that food. And then while they were fighting, a wolf came in or some other animal came in and just took their lunch and ran away. And that makes them realize, oh, if I keep fighting, the same thing could happen to me. Now all of a sudden, that story is more powerful and digestible while fighting is not good. And just resolving that internally is actually better. Stories help reframe our struggles and add meaning to life. Let's say there are three people cutting stones for some something, right? The first person, if you ask them, hey, why are you cutting the stone? I'm just cutting stones so that I can have some, you know, I can get food to eat and, you know, I get some place to stay because you know, I'm just doing it for a living. The second person who is cutting the stone, you ask them, hey, why are you cutting the stone? I'm cutting the stone because I'm building this, you know, my stone is going to be used in building this some monument or some, some, something. The third person is asked, like, why are you cutting the stone? And he was cutting it so well, much better than the first two person. And he says, I'm building this, I'm cutting the stone so that this stone is going to be used in this temple or this church. And it will be at the edifice of this temple, super important that this is why I'm doing it. So now the third person actually knew what's going on. Why are they doing the work that they're doing? They had a frame, they had a good frame of the work being impactful and meaningful. Similarly, as leaders, we all have work that we want our team members to do. But if you frame it as to why that work is important, why having high quality work is important, and how that work is actually used by real people in real life, and how it's going to add value, now that is powerful. People will do great work, have less quality issues, and they will actually persist in adversity to deliver great quality work. Stories are the best way in which you can invite someone to experience walk the walk, right? Versus talk the talk. Leaders tell why certain things are important, but if you have a story of why you did what you did, and now all of a sudden they can imagine yourself going through that situation. All right, fourth one. Stories can be replayed multiple times, especially once it is effectively delivered. So I can tell you as a leader to do certain things, but if I tell you a story, now all of a sudden that moral or that result of that story, you can replay over and over. So you can self-direct. You can self-direct yourself. You can. Um, use that model and guide your actions over and over. So this is replayed infinite number of times. Stories can last generations. So much more powerful than facts because people forget facts. Finally, stories help handle the paradoxes of life. Any decision can be a good decision for someone, bad decision for someone. But then if you, if you acknowledge that life is like that, there will be importance of both quantity and quality. There'll be importance for safety and freedom. There'll be importance for good and bad. There'll be times where certain things are done that has a that are focused on good, and there is good in all aspects, even if the decision sounds bad. So 
Life is full of paradoxes. You cannot reframe things in one versus the other, but you can do it with the power of story. So many reasons and practical reasons why stories are important. And further, if you make it even more concrete, remember, if you tell a really good, powerful story of living the value that you want to live, that will get passed down by people because people remember it. It's an emotional connection. People remember it. They'll pass it down. Those stories will, and those models will get passed down over maybe generations in your company. Facts. No one remembers it the next day. There are things in life which are gray areas. There's no black and white. And there will be answers put to certain questions which are like the bear trap questions where if you answer either ways, you're wrong. And so stories help with these kind of gray area scenarios where you can answer with a story and not with a definite simplistic worldview of what is right and what's wrong. So that's powerful. Stories help us to look for the big picture, forest for the trees. If you see someone just narrow, tunnel, selfish in certain aspects, stories can bring them out. Facts cannot bring them out. Finally, stories provide frameworks or repeated ways in which people can make decisions on their own versus direct answers. It's like teaching someone to fish versus actually giving them the fish. Super, super important to give how to do things versus doing it for them. If you have a tricky situation when you know your supervisor is wrong, how do you deliver that message? When do you deliver it? Stories will help you deliver those message. It's an emotion attached to it. It's pride aside to it. And it's various aspects. So if I were to tell you specifics, right, as to there was during COVID situation or during flooding, and I could say, hey, thousands of people were dead, uh, or uh, a lot of people, hundreds of thousands of people were locked in their homes. That's one way to tell the story. But if I can tell you a story of one person dying, if I can tell you the story of my near and dear person that I have in my family and what they went through in the COVID or during flooding, now that connects, that models the behavior and connects with you much more than the statistic of how many people died. So I'll end this with this quote from Joseph Stalin. Death of one man is a tragedy. Death of millions is a statistic. Remember this connects, specifics connect, stories connect, statistics and facts don't connect. So that's why stories are powerful. What is a story? Why is it so powerful? And how? Stories act much better than facts in real life. Tell your stories in a powerful way. What's the psychology behind landing a great story? There are five main techniques that we can use to land a really good, powerful message. First, we focus a lot on our story and the detail, the specifics, and you know, we talk about the story, we, you, know, you know, we have an agenda, we want to get through that message. So the what of your story, the heart of your story is more important to you than how you tell the story. So remember, it's more important to understand that how you tell your story and how your story lands is more important than just the story. So are you getting your audience to feel relaxed? Remember when we were told stories when we were young, it's always started with once upon a time. Now imagine when someone starts a story with once upon a time, you're automatically ready for an adventure. You're relaxed. Similarly, if someone grabs your attention with a story with the first few lines and makes you relaxed or grabs your attention, that is the how. How you do this is important. You want people to be engaged. You don't want them to be defensive by the kind of words that you use. You want their guards to be down. And you don't want it to be boring. There are lots of things people have to do. Now one more thing, they have to listen to you and now it's boring story. How, focus on the how. How do you deliver? Super, super important. Are you bringing your full set? Similarly, the detail of the how is also in the body language. 
Remember, people only listen 15% of the words that you tell them. Even right now, you're listening to me. Are you going to remember everything that I say? No. But you're going to watch a lot of things. How I'm delivering it. You're going to watch for a lot of details. You're going to watch how engaged am I in my conversation. You're going to watch how am I using my hands. Is it with purpose or am I just using it out of control? How is my body language? How is the detail of you know the, the cloth that I'm wearing, my haircut? You will see like how clean is my whiteboard. You will see a lot when you're telling a story. So bringing your full body to work in the way you want it, in an intentional way, is super important. Your hands, as I said, your facial expressions. Record yourself telling a story without voice on, or listen to your story without your voice on. Your face gives out a lot of things, your eyes, your tone, your, your lips. Facial expressions gives out lots of signal. Finally, the most important one is tone. If I don't really respect you as a listener, or I don't connect with you as a listener, my tone will not be appropriate. If I internally feel like, you know, scolding you, but I'm just giving you a story just to convince you, it's not going to land. My tone will overpower everything in my body language. So super important. Agree the lots of detail people look at. But if you don't connect with them genuinely, internally, and feel honored about your audience or who you are delivering this message to, and that you genuinely and authentically don't believe it, it will not land. Your message won't land. Because you're not really connected with them. And you really want to start your story with some connection with them. And we have lots of things in common to connect. As humans, we have emotions that are common. We, we all face fear. We all face greed. We all face dejection, we all face victory, joy, sorrow. So many life experiences when we were young to now. Common things, there's lots of common things to connect on. Connect with your audience before you go try to influence them with the story. So your body language is gonna show if you're connected with your audience. Multi-sensory. Story is the cheapest way to create a virtual reality in someone's mind. It's a call for adventure. If you call someone for adventure, you want to engage all of their senses. You want them to hear the voices that you have heard in the story. You want them to touch and feel the things that you have actually touched and feel. You want them to hear the voices. You want them to smell the smell that you have smelled. You want to bring them along in a multi-dimensional journey. Invoke all of their senses. Invoke not just the mind for imagination, also invoke all of their senses. Remember, human attention is very scarce. Even with your small group, if you are trying to influence your small group, getting their attention is scarce. There are a barrage of messages and notifications and work and home and all of those things that they are involved with that are going on in their background. But if you can connect with them at a multi-dimensional level, that is powerful. Because now all of a sudden you've given them an immersive virtual reality experience. So think about this. Deeply connect with your folks. Give them the attention and the gift of attention that they all want to be touched. Everyone wants to be touched. Everyone wants to forget all of these background noise that they have. But they don't need to do it if you're not boring. So don't be boring, right? Finally, take pauses. You might have a lot of things you want to tell your audiences. But even one or two sentences, if they cannot visualize because you didn't take the right pauses, you just moved on and on and on, you've lost them. Practice relaxation yourself with breathing, pause between important things so that they can visualize. Also, pace yourself. Pace yourself accordingly. You need to slow down at times. By pacing yourself, pausing, relaxing, breathing, what you're really doing is you're inviting them to pull for this new thing that will come up after you've said your few sentences. They want to hear. They want to pull from you. 
and then you pushing them information. So, importance of timing, important pauses, important pacing in between your sentences. Visualize it yourself to feel it yourself too. And finally, get rid of all the notes. You can't go in front of a stage and read things and have an influence as you can when you are speaking from the heart, speaking from the key points. At the end of it, what's really important is your audience connection with your audience and your delivery of your message. If you do connect genuinely with them and you land the message, looking at them in the eye, connecting by your movement in your stage towards people and away from people to show these contracts, that is what is powerful. That is what will truly give justice to the message that you're trying to deliver. It's not you or your ego or your delivery that's important, really. It's actually the justice you provide the message. When you think about this, your stresses will go away because you're like, I feel nervous on the stage. When it's not you, you are there to give justice to the topic at hand. Now that's more important to you than your own delivery. When you think about that, your stresses go away because you're there to give justice to that topic. And that topic is more important than the delivery. When you start focusing on that, you're gonna deliver just fine. So that's the psychology, five key takeaways on how to learn a very powerful story. Be a powerful storyteller. So storytelling is all about influence. It's all about influence, really. But there is no quick fix, meaning you can't just tell one story and imagine that everything will be taken care of and imagine that everything will be fine. No, there is no quick fix to any kind of influence in life. It's a beginning, of course. You're gonna have a pretty big impact on someone. But remember that there is no quick fix. There's gonna be huge amount of consistency you would have to be and do over time. A lot of consistency has to be shown. As a leader, storytelling alone won't be sufficient if you're not consistent with it. Meaning if you tell a really powerful story the next day, you just contradicted your story, that's not gonna work. So consistency over time is super important to, to build trust, but also to realize that there is no quick fix to any influence. And remember, Although everyone is being judged in a very limited period of time in like, let's say skip level meetings or in your one-on-one -on -one conversation or when you are presenting on stage or sharing your story, remember that judgments are being made. People have limited time. So what you do, how you present yourself, how you prepare, how ready you are is super critical. So, and that plays a huge role in influence. And also remember, pre-wiring or off-stage work, where you try to do a lot of homework before you come into and sharing the story. You know the audience, you know your material, you know why it's important, you know answers to questions that you can anticipate. A lot of pre-wiring and off-stage work also goes into influence. So I wanted to highlight some of these aspects from one of the chapters in the book. It's primarily that hey, it's not just about the story that you learn. You have to consistently act you have to make sure that uh, you are aware of all of these biases and judgments that people are making. And remember, people have stories in their mind. They have their own pre-wiring, they have their own stories. And not everything that you say can land in the right way. They could be running in their own minds with their own stories. And you know, whatever you say is right may not be the just thing for someone because they have their own stories of how they interpret this. So give them the time and space, yeah? And whenever you see some setback, when you couldn't influence, even with your powerful story, seek to learn more. There's always something behind this, yeah? So remember this aspect of storytelling, which is, it is hugely to influence people, to transfer emotion, to get them to move, you know, from one state of being and feeling to other state in a much positive way, but there's always gonna be these other things that are required for influence, yeah? 
So what's the one major thing that's really needed? As I said, people have their own stories. They have their mind full when they're listening to you. So maybe things are just going from one ear and going out from the other ear. So the biggest tool that helps you as a leader to have an influence and to have a possibility that someone has an open mind is listening. You as a leader, before you go up on stage or before you present, you better listen to someone else's story. You better listen to and understand their situation. You better understand where they're coming from. You want to understand what their what the background is, what their life stories are like, what they value, what their dreams are, what their aspirations are, without listening first. Without listening first, there is absolutely no possibility of having influence. Because as I said, people have their own answers, they have their own wiring, they have their own ways of thinking. So listening first is a super important aspect of any influence either via storytelling or any other influence tactic that you use. Why? Because as I said, people have their mental cup full. It's full. They have too many things going on. They have their own stories. They have their own vivid memories of past injustices or past experiences from a bad leader or from bad work experiences or from a family situation. There's so much going on with people. So before you allow them to reduce some of that load that they are going through, before you allow them to express, and by expressing and listening to their story, that's when they have a possibility to listen to your story and add something else or replace their existing one with yours. So listening is super important. It's like listening is like preparing the surface to paint. When we paint, we first clean the surface or we give this gift of someone to say, hey, tell me your story. Now I understand you. Now they have listened to their own story when they are talking. So when you listen deeply, you're giving the gift to the speaker to tell us what they have gone through, relive their experiences. And when they're doing that, they're also listening. As a speaker, they're listening to their own words. So speaking is also listening. Speaking is also listening. When a speaker is speaking, they're listening, right? And so when they are listening to their own story, there is a possibility that they may revisit their conclusions, especially when you have given them the gift of listening to them fully, that when you tell them your story with something else or some different perspective, they will give you the chance to replace their old story. Right? Because now you're genuinely connected with them. When you connect with someone by deeply listening, you are preparing the service on the listener. Because now they will listen back to you and they'll give you the same attention. They'll actually honor you. They'll actually genuinely know you and connect with you. And that connection is super important. Before you connect, there is no chance of influence. There is no chance of influence. Spend the time to connect with your audience or your team. And, and that is the same connection, it's the same as understanding what are the mental terrains of your people. What are they going through? What is, what is it that you are up for influencing? If you don't understand the larger picture, there is no possibility to influence. So listening is a major prerequisite. And that's why you listen first. You, you do one-on-one -on -one conversations, you understand people. You don't go in and just come up with a powerful story you first understand their situation maybe you customize it and when that's when you have a powerful story to land so that's the importance of listening there are some of these don'ts that are obvious but super important remember storytelling is a powerful technique you get access to someone's mind you get access to someone's mind and how they think and feel they'll be vulnerable to you you can exploit it, but that's the last thing you want to do because you never get the chance again. So there are some of these obvious don'ts that are super important. Don't project superiority. It just distances you from them. They'll never, they'll just have their guards up in front of you. Do not ignore negative emotion. When you tell someone 
some story or you're trying to persuade someone or influence someone and they don't get it and then they have a negative reaction to it, do not ignore it. Say, hey, they'll, they'll think about it, they'll learn, go deep, learn more. Because if you ignore it, that negative emotion festers and that could be harmful for the team. There will be a lot of different categories of people, unwilling, who are people who are unconcerned, unmotivated, cynical. And each of these categories of people will have a different appetite to listen to your story and get influenced. Remember that. You would want to get evidence to some of those cynical folks so that they know that you have data to back it. And you would want to connect with these people before you try to influence them with, you know, just facts won't do it. Yeah? And at some point, you'd have to take action. You'd want to say, hey, you don't agree with me, but as a leader, we have to make a decision. I told you a powerful reason with the story why this is important, but at some point, you have to get them in line and help get progress towards the goal. So remember that this is important tactics. Um, winning and losing is, is the last thing you want to do in framing a story. Like, you know, if the other person listening feels like a loser because you just, you know, told them with a story why they were wrong. That's important to remember, uh, to not categorize people as like, hey, you're bad. You absolutely didn't understand and, you know, the villain in that story is exactly you. You just lost people if you did that. Uh, similarly with blame. You can tell the truth, but if you do that with blame, you're going to lose people. You can easily instigate people with fear, but hope is more powerful. Don't use fear. Don't ramble. Don't ramble. Don't be boring. There's so much content to watch on the internet, and now all of a sudden they're listening to you, now you're boring, or they're into a conversation with you in a meeting, which costs company thousands of dollars, and now you're boring, and now that's just a complete waste. So obvious don'ts, don't do it, yeah? Don't do it. Uh, and finally, like, also like, don't have a template. You, you, all of your stories begin with like, you know, a hero ending at the end and a villain ending, you know, whatever. Come up with new ideas. So that's what gets us to this, as a life of a storyteller, how do we continue to get better at this? Because if you just have a template, you might do really well in the first story to influence people, but now that they get it, say, oh, this is how, you know, this leader always peps us and then, you know, does these pep talks and all of that, right? So don't, don't be boring. Don't use a template that just consistently people can predict you, right? So for that, we need a daily practice. We need to constantly improve our art of storytelling. Remember, there's been times when you trying to influence someone when they have a dilemma and you're trying to get them to understand a better side of the story. And then after the conversation, a few hours have gone and you realize a perfect story to tell them. This is a time lag that we all face. Why? Because we are not practicing the art of storytelling. We don't have a repository of really great stories in us because we don't practice storytelling. This is important. So daily practice is super important. And you should start to look at themes on a daily basis, like some patterns that you see, some consequences that you've observed with some results some childhood trauma or experiences or even real life current setbacks that you have gone through, what kind of values do you, you know, uh, value and why, who are the people that you admire and why, what kind of stories have stuck with you and what are the utilities. So there's some examples of how you can get really good at daily practice of storytelling. So get good at it, yeah? Because without that, there is no chance that you will actually have instant influence because you'd have to be fully present and be ready to influence with the story. So you'll not have this time lag and you're constantly learning something new, yeah? Remember, every time you tell a story, you're breathing life into it. Every time you tell a story, you're breathing life into it. People find meaning with stories that we've seen. You can build bridges, people can work together, they can work on something much bigger that's difficult. They can get away from the selfish desire to a much larger moral selfless action. Things about climate change, things about uh, justice, things about protecting human rights. All of those things will come if you have a powerful story. Finally, your story is your authenticity. 
if you become really good at storytelling and if you can genuinely represent who you are because now you practice these skills then you have a chance to be truly authentic of who you are because we, we all feel this we all feel what if I could have represented myself as I truly am after the fact things have gone because you have not practiced practicing storytelling is super powerful and you all can be super powerful so let's be the most powerful storyteller we can ever be in our life. Good luck.